Greetings. This is Caroline Staten with Transition US and want to welcome people to our teleseminar today. Uh, our principal aim in providing these events is to provide practical support to the leaders of transition initiatives, those who are mulling over starting an initiative, or starting some similar resilience building work within their communities. So these events are for community leaders working on resilience across the country and also we're often joined by people from other countries. So welcome all of you. And I wanted to ask that you consider making a donation to Transition US at transitionus.org. And the reason that I'm asking for this is that these events um, are offered at no charge and it really supports us uh, if people could step up and provide some support so we can offer these at no charge. So thank you deeply in advance to those of you who are able to do this. And without further ado, I want to introduce our guest today. And this event is really focused on the great work that Jamaica Plain, part of Boston, um, that Jamaica Plain is doing, the transition group there. And this event is called How Jamaica Plain is Building Working Class Leadership in the New Economy. And why we're so excited about this is that Jamaica Plain is really doing cutting edge work on race and class, uh, like no other um, transition effort that we've seen. So we're really thrilled to have Carlos with us today. And just a few other things about Jamaica Plain. They've got a number of wonderful projects. So um, Carlos can direct us to the web page where you can see a lot more of this. But one of, them, um, one of the great stories that really got us excited uh, is that they helped an immigrant-owned dry cleaner transition to an environment friendly wet cleaner and really got the community support behind them to do that. It's a great story about that. Um, and they have a number of projects. One is Cancer Free Economy and they're engaged in the Boston Food Forest Coalition. They've got a time exchange and the thing that um, we'll be hearing about a lot more today with Carlos is the Community Leaders Fellowship. And Carlos is the lead in that um, effort. He's the director of community organizing. So uh, we're really thrilled to have you with us today. Um, Carlos Espinoso Toro um, is our guest. And um, over to you, Carlos, and lead us through. Um, you've got some slides for us. Again, um, the PDF was mailed to you. Uh, or is available on our website with the event. And, uh, and I'm really thrilled, Carlos, that you're joining us and tell us all about the Community Leaders Fellowship. Great. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, and thank everybody for um, being a participant on this call. Um, my name is Carlos Espinosa Toro, and I'm the Director of Community Organizing of the Jamaica Plain New Economy Transition, JPNET. Uh, JPNET, the organization that I work with, our vision, uh, I'm sorry, our mission is to create a local economy that works for everyone in harmony with the planet. And one of the ways in which we do that is by building community resilience through address, addressing racial and class tensions. You can, look, you can learn more about us at our website at jptransition.org. So I'm moving to the second slide because before I tell you about the Community Leaders Fellowship, I want to tell you a little bit of background um, before that. I work, as Carolyn has mentioned, in Jamaica Plain. Jamaica Plain is a neighborhood in Boston. Boston has over a dozen neighborhoods, and Jamaica Plain is one of them a bit south of the downtown Boston area. I wanted to give you a description, a rough description of Jamaica Plains' main highlights of demography. 
Uh, the first one is the population is roughly 40,000 folks, 56% white, and 22% Latino. Uh, Jamaica Plain, if you look at it in the map, um, you can um, take the train, I believe, from one side of the north part of Jamaica Plain to the south side of the Jamaica Plain, and it's roughly two miles. So you can take the train and go from one side of Jamaica Plain to another in probably less than 10 minutes. You can also walk uh, from uh, the north part of Jamaica Plain to the south part of Jamaica Plain. I think it might take you about 30 minutes. It is a very walkable neighborhood. Uh, it has the largest Latino business district in New England. It has the most green space per capita of any Boston neighborhood. A little bit south of Jamaica Plain, there's a big park called the Arboretum. Um, it also has tremendous challenges as any uh, big city or uh, global city in the United States. One of them is gentrification. It's the third most expensive neighborhood in Boston. Uh, and it's going rapidly through a process of gentrification, uh, especially in the areas that JPNet is working at. Uh, there's also a tradition of activism, uh, which is really um, uh, very long, um, uh, has been going on for quite a bit of years. In the 1970s, um, the community got together to stop the construction of a highway called the I-95. This was a highway that was going to split the neighborhood in half. And in celebration of their achievement, they created a festival called Wake Up the Earth, which is one of the many festivals that Jamaica Plain has. In the 1990s, uh, folks in Jamaica Plain created the JP Neighborhood Council. Even though Jamaica Plain is part of the city of Boston, uh, it really uh, tries to uh, get really involved in civic activism. And the JP Neighborhood Council is a way in which every single development, it allows for folks to have a voice over every single development that gets done in Jamaica Plain. So again, to summarize, Jamaica Plain, a neighborhood in Boston, from north to south, roughly two miles, um, it has it's very walkable, accessible uh, by train and by public transportation like bus, uh, and just some challenges and also a tradition of activism. I'm going to move on now to the third slide. The third slide talks a little bit about a story, a story that we uh, say in Jamaica Plain is called the story of the two JPs. Now, why is it called the two JPs? It's mainly because of the difference between class, mostly class and race and class. Uh, there's a part of Jamaica Plain that has been traditionally uh, close, sorry, traditionally fairly wealthy. It's close to a pond called the Jamaica Plain Pond. Um, and um, it has a, a Main Street business corridor called the Center South Main Street. Usually, you know, chains, um, uh, places like Whole Foods, um, uh, coffee shops like Cafe Nero. Um, and then north of Jamaica Plain, closer to an area called the Eggleston Square area or the Hyde Square, uh, Hyde Jackson Square area. It's a much more immigrant rooted neighborhood. Uh, folks that have been living there for many years. There's a lot of bodegas. Um, uh, for instance, the one that I'm showing on this picture is called Plaza Meat Market, which sells uh, mainly uh, caters uh, to the Dominican and Puerto Rican community that have been living in Jamaica Plain for many years. And if you look at the slide at the top, there is a scene of folks dancing. These are teenagers. Uh, they're dancing in an area that is close to Hyde Square. It's called the Blessed Sacrament, which is a huge church. And there's an organization called there, the Hyde Square Task Force, that focuses on creating Latino leadership in the area. Now, there is, there is a story of two JPs because for the most part, some of these events, uh, especially the folks that go to these different events and attend and patronize these different businesses, usually are from different class and race. I'm going to go to the third uh, slide. But before I continue, uh, because I'm explaining Jamaica Plain and because it might be a neighborhood that is, it might be unique, I don't know, I'd just like to get a sense of uh, the folks that we have uh, on the call. 
And I'm going to use um, this system where you can press you can press a number so that you can answer the question. I'd like to ask you, if you live in a neighborhood where you can walk to get your food, uh, to get your basic needs, and also if you can walk to work, please press 1. Those of you who cannot, uh, you know, to have to drive to get their basic needs, uh, a grocery store or other places, uh, or have to drive to work, please press 2. And I'm going to ask Carolyn to let me know um, the results. Yeah, so again, press 1 on your keypad if you can walk um, to get your basic services or walking to work. And two, if you really need to drive to get most of that, uh, both most of your services and um, to go to work. Um, so, and if you're not able to press a number on your keypad, um, I can imagine that some of you might not be able to, so stay hands-free <laughs> if you're driving or anything. Um, so we have 14% Carlos pressed one, mm -hmm. okay. and 42 percent pressed two. So the majority of people are driving and not walking to get their yeah. needs met. And then there were um, several, uh, there were I think four people that were unable to press a number. Okay. So that, that gives a sense of, of the people on the call. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, I may have another, I may throw another uh, question at you guys really soon, but uh, let me just uh, explain a couple of things that the Jamaica Plain New Economy Transition does. How do we crystallize our mission of um, you know, creating a local economy and building uh, resilience? We have, in the slide that I'm showing, which is one, two, three, four, the fourth slide, we have uh, a couple of images that are from a public event, a public forum called the State of Our Neighborhood. The State of Our Neighborhood is a public event that brings uh, neighbors, um, uh, nonprofit leaders, elected officials, um, and folks, uh, leaders in the community to talk about issues in the neighborhood, like for instance, housing or accessibility to health uh, or um, small business development, and to present some of these issues to the elected officials and ask the elected officials, engage them in dialogue and ask them to champion some of these uh, solutions that are presented at the state of our neighborhood. Uh, as you can see in this, in this image, this is uh, the event that happened, this is the state of our neighborhood that happened this year, just last week on Thursday, February the 27th. Um, at the top, you can see the elected officials that are uh, sitting in between community representatives. Some of these elected officials are senators and representatives from the state of Massachusetts, and some of them are counselors from the city uh, of Boston. In this case, we talk about housing. Uh, instead of our neighborhood, the main impact is that it's truly really built relationships among neighbors. It gets them out of their homes to come and get to know each other, and also to really care and develop a culture of dealing uh, and engaging in public dialogue and political dialogue. I'm going to go to the next slide, which is the fifth slide. It's a very quick example of a very concrete project. So the State of Our Neighborhood is an event, and this is a project called the Boston Food Forest. Now, what you have in the picture is a group of folks that are doing permaculture. Uh, it's a way in which to do agriculture, uh, focusing on the relationship with the plants, among the plants, to do it in an organic manner. Now, on the right side, there's a gentleman with a hat. His name is Dan Schenk. He's actually a community leaders fellow, or he used to be. He's an alumni now. And he works uh, quite a bit doing trainings, getting folks to meetings, and getting folks to do these working days at the Boston Food Forest. The Boston Food Forest is a network of edible gardens um, uh, for folks to pick the fruits, um, whether it's uh, uh, trees that um, they're not trees or they're um, uh, green uh, vegetables. They come together 
uh, to get to know each other, but also to plant these, uh, um, to cultivate these plants in different areas in Boston for anybody to pick them, uh, increasing the accessibility of local healthy food. But it also increasing, you know, exercise and relationship among neighbors. They do this, uh, the Boston Food Forest does this in different sites. One of their flagship sites is in a neighborhood called Matapan. Matapan is another neighborhood um, uh, fairly diverse um, um, in uh, Boston. This third, this sixth slide that, um, that I'm showing, it's the grand opening of the JMP dry cleaners. This is the story that Caroline was talking about. In this slide, you can see, it's interesting, you see uh, a lot of Latino leaders uh, from the left to right, we have Felix Arroyo, who is a, a longtime Latino leader in the city of Boston, and son, Senator Sonia Chan Diaz. And to the right of them, you have Ernesto and Mayra Vargas and their sons in the back. They are the owners of JMP Dry Cleaners. The inspirational story about this, this grand opening is that they were able to go green, which is to eliminate the use of perchloritine using wet cleaning uh, as a professional professional weight cleaning, uh, and at the same time raising money to do so from the community. We conducted a Kickstarter campaign where we raised roughly $18,000 from different donors from Jamaica Plain. And in addition to that, we also received additional donations as well as grants from the State Department and from the city. Before I move to the next slide, this is when I start talking about the story of the Community Leaders Fellowship. But before I move to the next slide, I have another question I'd like to ask uh, to the audience. And I also would like for you to take a look at your uh, phone pads, uh, your pads, and uh, press um, your keys. Let me ask you this question, or let me ask you this. If you live or work in a multiracial setting, please press one. If you do not live or work in a multiracial setting, please press two. If you don't know, or maybe you don't get a chance to know your neighbors and who lives around you, please press three. I'm going to ask Caroline to help me out. So yes, yeah, so press one if you live or work in a multiracial setting. Um, press 2 if you do not live in, or work in a multiracial setting. And press 3 if you don't actually know who, uh, you know who who your neighbors are and you don't really know if there's multiracial um, diversity in your neighborhood or not. Um, so Carlos, we have 64% say they do uh, live okay. or work in a multiracial setting, and 14% say they don't. And no one mm -hmm. um, pressed the, the third option. Um, so All right. everyone, everyone's aware of, of that. So thank you. Fantastic. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Sounds great. So it seems that the majority of folks uh, in our audience do live or work in multiracial settings. Um, fantastic. I wanted to um, start now to tell you the story of the Community Leaders Fellowship. This is a story that you read if you read the Yes Magazine article. Um, and this is how the story starts. This image is an image of a multilingual uh, pot like we put together in Jamaica Plain. Um, and it was based on, it was a reflection on gentrification. For those of you not familiar with the term, um, gentrification is really a very complex phenomenon, but it's associated, especially its negative effects, with displacement. Displacement of folks who cannot afford rising rents and folks moving in who do love the area and want to invest in it, uh, but because they can afford a higher rents, inevitably displace those who cannot. Um, now, this happens in this proportionate manner um, to the detriment of folks of color and vulnerable populations. Um, I wanted to show this slide because if you look at, let's say, um, uh, on the left side, you see a group of women. There's a, a, a young girl, 
and there's two women. One is sitting to my left and one is sitting to my right. The woman sitting to my left, her name is Desiree Franjul. She's sitting right in front of the notepad. And she is uh, one of the persons that I talk about in the story. When I was starting to uh, work as an organizer in Jamaica Plain, one of my first mandates was to increase the levels of diversity. Um, and the reason was that uh, we had a fairly monolithic uh, or um, non, not that diverse crowd. Um, and because we were focusing uh, on certain topics, we're also just bringing a self-selected group of folks. And this wasn't representative of the population in Jamaica Plain. So it was important for us to look at, um, dig deeper into why um, diversity was not shown in the constituency. This meeting, I, when I walked around Jamaica Plain, I realized that uh, there's, there are, you know, folks knew what were the issues of climate change. They knew the issues of inequality, income inequality. They knew the issues of uh, lack of, um, you know, great education, public schools, and transportation. And they wanted to do something about it. However, it was very difficult, especially those who came from unprivileged, not privileged backgrounds, because they worked very hard. They had two to three jobs. They have families. And they didn't have enough time. And therefore, that's the reason why they were not necessarily engaging in the projects and our mission and um, you know, furthering our mission. The reason why I conducted this meeting is because the theme that was very prevalent was gentrification. Folks were saying, you know, I've been working in this community for many years, and now many of the folks that I grew up with are not here anymore. My cultural well-being is not nurtured. Uh, I don't have the shops where I used to shop. Uh, if I was an immigrant from the Dominican Republic or Venezuela or other places in Latin America, now I don't feel like I have these shops that were able to nurture my cultural well-being. So to me, it was important to validate the uh, issues that folks were putting on the table. And that's why I created this forum on gentrification. Uh, the reason why this is important also is because we usually had done forums on climate change and sustainability. And we changed this to do it on gentrification because that was important for us, again, to validate uh, the issues that folks were caring about. And in addition to that, we conducted this entire forum in Spanish with interpretation to English through our, our, our microphones. I'm going to go to the next slide and continue the story. Because I understood that it was important for us to, first of all, listen to folks and see what are the issues that they care about. In addition to that, it was important to acknowledge that folks um, uh, need something in return. Um, you know, if they have two or three jobs, why would they come to an event? Why would they engage in the work that we do? Um, and, and, and most of the folks that I was talking to would always say to me that they were underemployed or unemployed, or they had just, or they really wanted to do meaningful work, but they didn't know how to. They wanted to engage in a better way of doing. They wanted to grow plants. They wanted to, uh, you know, create better housing for folks, but they didn't know, they didn't have any platforms that enabled them to do so. Most of the platforms were based on volunteerism only. So I came up with the idea of the Community Leaders Fellowship. And I'm going to read this just a, lie, a little bit because it's very ambitious. <laughs> and I'll tell you where we're at right now. Uh, we envision a social movement built on individuals' hearts and minds. And we call that the software and which does not depend solely on developing material assets. And we call that the hardware. Or it could be a home or something that is bricks and mortar. Uh, the fellowship envisions an influential network of leaders in which each individual lives and evolves the new economy principles of resilience, carrying them across age, render, gender, race, class, and geographic location. Uh, our mission is. Uh, to create leaders that will lead a project and or live and work within the new economy principles of individual and community resilience. And this is the part that I like a lot, which is the part that I put my heart and mind on. 
I want to base this leadership, this, this opportunity for folks to engage in our work based on the value that nurturing an individual's heart and mind through education, capacity for reflection, emotional intelligence, and capacity to dream without limitations is the most resilient investment that can be made. And in addition, the fellowship is also based on the strong belief that anyone can be supportively guided into becoming a leader in the new economy movement. So these are the ideas that were going through my mind after I perform a reflection on why, how we can better engage folks from underprivileged backgrounds uh, and having those voice in our work which are really needed. I'm going to move on to the next slide now, which is uh, talks about the Community Leaders Fellowship. I'm going to go a little quickly on this because it's really the nuts and bolts, but I just wanted to give you a, a quick understanding of how it works operationally. The fellows are, you can see in the middle of the slide, a pipeline. Uh, from left to right, the fellows are recruited. They are matched to a project. They are matched to a project coordinator. And then uh, the work starts, transforming the work into leadership. Then they complete the program. And then they can re-enter the fellowship for another cycle. They can re-enter for as many cycles as they want. If they exit, they automatically become a part of the network of leaders, which we call the alumni network. At the top, you see something that is called uh, equal exchange. That was a fundamental belief of mine that if I'm going to ask for people to give their time, I need to provide equal benefits comparable to that. So you see an arrow at the top that says fellowship work perform on projects and events. That arrow is the work that the fellowship is performing. And in exchange for that work, we provide benefits. And you can see at the bottom, um, three or four arrows moving up or pointing up. And those are the benefits um, that are individual mentoring and coaching and group support sessions. And this is how the fellowship works. I'm going to move on to the next slide, um, which is um, bringing, uh, highlighting the Cire story a little bit. This is the woman that was sitting at this multi multilingual that I had, uh, that I put together for reflection on gentrification. Uh, this is from Joel, who is he, uh, here on the left side, um, became a fellow. Uh, she didn't have, um, you know, um, we couldn't offer her money, but we offer her the opportunity to become a leader in the community, to organize events. And here is she organizing a sports event that we conducted last summer in which we brought a diverse group of folks together around sports. Uh, this was completely non-traditional. You know, we usually at events, we sit in a circle and we talk about issues and we're a little bit more serious about this. Uh, in, you know, we, we seem a little serious, a little um, too grave. This one, uh, we inverted that and we decided to focus on fun. What would it mean for us to have fun together, uh, enjoying uh, playing sports? And then after we did this, we'll talk about, you know, what are our reflections? Now that we're together uh, playing a sport, how do we see each other bridging across race and class divides? And you can see those race and class divides already there uh, in this picture. I'm going to move to the next slide, um, which is a slide that contains four pictures. And these are pictures of different uh, um, uh, stages of our fellowship. Uh, on the left-hand side, the top left-hand side, there's a picture of us on the orientation session. Uh, there's a young woman with black hair. Her name is Janet Orihel. She's a Hispanic uh, Latino student in journalism, and she's currently working with us in communications. Um, this is the first orientation session that we usually do with the fellows in order to introduce them to the work. If you look at the picture at the bottom side, um, right underneath, right uh, um, uh, under that uh, first picture, you would see my colleague Orion Kriegman. He's on the right side, and other fellows. And these are the kind of meetings that we have in the, during the support sessions. We bring them together because they've been working out there, whether in the Boston Food Forest or in the cancer-free economy or many other of our projects. And we bring them together to reflect not only to reflect, but also to provide peer-to-peer -peer support among each other. What are the challenges that are facing? And what are they learning 
uh, are facing those challenges. This is where we create the space for people to reflect on failures and successes. It's important to create a safe space for that kind of reflection. On the top right hand side, uh, you can see a picture of one of our retreats. Our retreats are an important part of the fellowship because they come together for a longer period, three hours, to actually uh, create a common bond among their work. They've been working, they've been going to the support sessions, but they need to reflect on how are they establishing uh, bonds between themselves that will last for a long time. So we bring them together to talk about their experiences and to talk about what is the value of the fellowship collectively. Um, at the bottom of, the, of this picture, bottom right hand side, that's just a very fun picture of uh, a group of fellows. This was the, the last cycle, not this, the scoring one. The last cycle that lasted um, was during the fall of 2014. And for some reason, a, a lot of them were, were Latino. You would have uh, Byron Garcia, the uh, gentleman with glasses and the cap. And then uh, we have Cristina Regon, who was uh, an immigrant from Mexico, who is an immigrant from Mexico, and Paola Liendo, an immigrant from Bolivia. Um, the next slide um, it's, um, that I'm uh, focusing on is, uh, shows the new um, Spring 2015 class of fellows. And as you can see, um, in this case, we have a little bit of a gender imbalance. <laughs> uh, most of them are, actually all of them are women. And uh, there's, I'm there with Orion Krigman. On the left side is my colleague and myself and Sarah Burns next to um, Orion, a little bit at the front. But we have Janet Origel, who is the Latina uh, fellow, and other folks, Annie Hamilton, Talia Zareto, uh, going from left to right, Kerry and uh, Ariel, and all of them uh, live in the Jamaica Plain or adjacent neighborhoods. Um, only one of them lives in Somerville, which is another city close to the Boston area. They are professionals, and they come from different backgrounds in terms of class. Um, and that's um, the story of the fellowship. And now um, I just wanted to um, finish that story by letting you know that the fellowship now has roughly uh, more than 20 folks in the alum as alumni. They have graduated. Some of them continue. Um, we invite them to different events, and they're always very involved in the work that we do. They help and volunteer in our events. Um, they speak in, on behalf of our work in different events. Um, they promote our work as well as talk to folks about the fellowship itself. Uh, they themselves are successful at what they do. Uh, one, of our, one of our most successful fellows uh, is, has now her um, uh, business as an illustrator and continues to work for nonprofit organizations that does mission-based work. We have other fellows that have got full-time jobs working in permaculture or urban agriculture. Uh, and I wanted now to just mention very quickly some challenges, some questions that I want to pose also, I want to put on the table uh, before we open up for Q&A. And some of those challenges are the following. Um, what is an equal exchange uh, for a project work done um, and receiving benefits when we consider privilege, when some have more than others, uh, when have some more safety net than others. Um, what about what happens when developing the software, which is the capacity for reflection, dreaming without limitations, providing the, the professional skills may not be enough. What happens when we need to tackle affordable housing, and things that are very concrete and tangible, um, being able to stay and live in a place so that we continue the work. Um, how does the fellowship address the challenges of diversity in day-to-day -day work? Uh, when we talk about diversity, it's not just race and class. It's also about academic backgrounds um, and certain, um, uh, you know, uh, being able to carry uh, 
considerable load of a work. What happens when some folks may struggle with it while others don't? How does the fellowship handle that? Um, in terms of future growth, if we do want to grow this fellowship so that we can uh, provide this opportunity for enormous, for a large number of individuals, how do we make sure that we still provide individualized attention that the fellows require and we don't create a one-size-fits-all? Um, and then one last one, a very important one, what happens when we need, we're putting so much work into this, when we need certain amount of funding for the sustainability of the project itself? So I'm going to leave you with those challenges of the fellowship, and then I'll open up for questions. Caroline? Thank you so much, Carlos. And um, so for people who have a question or comment, you can press 1 on your keypad, and I'll call on you. So again, press 1 on your keypad if you have a question or comment. And Carlos, while people are, um, are getting ready to do that, I was mm -hmm. wondering, I had a question for you, and that sure. is, um, how, how might one go about replicating what you're doing? I know that a number of people on the call are in uh, urban centers, and um, what might be a good, what, what would be your suggestion in, in how they start doing something like this? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so um, every single application of an idea um, has a certain context. Um, um, first of all, I would say that um, you can always talk with us and contact me at uh, my information that Caroline has, but you know, Carlos at jpnet, uh, I'm sorry, at jptransition.org. Uh, you can also find information on our website, jptransition.org. Uh, moving beyond that, um, it, it will be important for you to, to find out certain elements of the fellowship that could be transferable. For instance, equal exchange, the idea that we have about equal exchange in which people bring work in exchange of benefits, it could be transferable to any settings. I believe in any setting, urban setting, folks can look at um, using the equal exchange principle as something that could be very beneficial. And it really encourages people to uh, participate because it's not just volunteering. They're taking something with them out of it. Um, the second value that is very transferable is to really value the contribution that everybody in your community brings to the table. Is to truly believe that their contribution is valuable and to nurture it. I think that's important. If you live in a community where, let's say, some folks may be more seniors than, um, uh, or some folks may have a, you know, they're um, maybe uh, more working class, valuing that contribution from many different folks is very important, and we do so. We, we bring folks together, we match them with projects that can enhance that, those skills, and then we give them the benefits that they need, professional coaching to actually enhance those skills and use them for their next career. So that's access. I think that's something that can be very, very transferable to any kind of community. Um, in addition to that, um, I think one of the third values uh, that I believe will be important to consider is that we have to value that this work is not just short term. I think that if you're in your community and you're thinking about folks carrying a vision of the new economy, you have to think about long term. And I think, um, uh, you know, this, the fellowship works great with that because even though folks may have to move on to other areas, they may be displaced for, or for any other reason, uh, the long-term commitment, the long-term approach is very important. If you apply a similar long-term approach that we do here in Jamaica Plain, the person will carry that long-term approach to anywhere they go, any communities. And that's the reason why we always put there you know, individuals live and evolve the new economy principles, carrying them across age, gender, race, class, 
and geographic location. Uh, I think I'm going to stop there, but those are the three elements that I would say you can, you can borrow from them to create a, a leadership development uh, group in your own communities. The things that may, you may have to uh, think about in context with your community is the times, um, you know, how many months, uh, you know, maybe some nuts and bolts about who does the recruiting, what kind of projects people get involved in. But those are just things that could be, you know, calibrated between one community to another. Thank you, Carlos. And I, I think, you know, I'll take some more questions and maybe you can let us know sort of what costs might be involved in kicking off something too. Of course, of course. Would you like me to answer that question now? If it's a, a quick one, I, I want to get to everyone else too, but I'm sure. Yes. Um, the <laughs> The actual answer is I don't have a rough number yet. We're preparing that right now. But what I can say is the following. Um, for the fellow, the, the work of the fellowship, one fellow puts roughly 180 hours every four months on it, uh, hours working on projects, working on projects. And I'm going to say that a manager like myself, a supervisor, uh, supervising them may put roughly half of that, uh, maybe a little less, like 40 hours. Uh, so I'm going to say, you know, overall, if we consider only one fellow and one supervisor is roughly, let's say, 180 plus 40. Uh, it's about 220 hours. And if you multiply that by a certain factor, if you want to make this more financial, then you can, you can use that as a formula. In addition to that, there's also hours. Um, these, these hours are included on the support sessions and the coaching sessions. Thank you. Um, I want to go to Ken White. Hi, Ken. Go ahead. Caroline, and hello, Carlos. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I just had a question. I think you mentioned when you were describing the fellows in the picture that they were all professionals. Um, so, uh, and I just want to be clear, uh, this is, they're doing this through fellowships in addition to whatever work that they're already doing. If this is not a full-time commitment on their part. It's 180 hours per month per person mm -hmm. to be a fellow approximately. Is that right? Uh, so they are, um, um, all of them are not working, they're not working full-time. At the moment, they are um, working part time on different jobs. Some of them have quit their full time jobs and just work part time in other jobs. Um, but they are not working currently working full time. We have experience with one or two fellows that were working full time and they really it didn't really work very well. So. Um, we don't discourage folks from applying, but we let them know that there is a risk. Uh, that it's important for them to understand that um, even if it's 10 to 12 hours per week, um, fellows that are more successful than others is because they have um, they they can work part time while they're doing the fellowship. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Ken. I wanted to go to Marissa. Thanks, Caroline. Hi, Carlos. Hi, Marisa. Ken asked one of my questions as well, um, but I do. I'm also wondering what is the time breakdown in terms of the amount of time folks are spending working on the projects versus coming together for mentorship and support. Um, out of those 10 to 12 hours per week, like how many hours are they working on projects, and how many hours are you doing the more internal work? And then my other question is, what is the typical age range of participants? Uh, what is your second question again? The what? What is the typical age range? Oh, age range. OK. All right, so I'll, ask, I'll answer the first question. Um, they work 136 project hours, eight hours per week. They work 16 outreach and staffing hours for major events, like the state of our neighborhood. They do seven hours of coaching sessions, and they do 11 hours of support sessions. And this will bring to a sum of 117 hours for the entire fellowship, 
which is 17 weeks. Um, the second question was the age range. Um, it's difficult to, to gather, but I'm going to say for the most part between 25 and 45 is the majority. However, we do have some folks who are 23 years old and um, some folks who are 60, um, in their 60s. Uh, this was the case of Mary Harman, a uh, fellow uh, last year who was in her 60s. And then the case of Annie Hamilton and uh, Janet who are um, below 25. Thank you, um, Carlos. I wanted to, again, invite people who had a question or comment to press 1 on your keypad. And Oliver, um, I see that you may have pressed 3 and wanted to know if that was inadvertent or if you have a question. Um, Oliver? Yeah, I could ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I wanted to know if, uh, I guess, getting started, uh, what type of maybe community partnerships or businesses you reached out to, I guess, in starting the fellowship, or what type of uh, support you had going into it? Uh, great, yeah. Excellent question. Um, so the assets that I had with me um, were that we had already a constituency of certain amount of folks, and they were the first ones who became fellows. So that was one thing. There was already a created membership. Uh, number two, we had projects, uh, like the Boston Food Forest Project, um, which involved uh, these initial fellows directly. Uh, number three, we had uh, some partners like the Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Development Corporation who um, um, provide us with opportunities to talk to their membership uh, living in low-income housing to um, uh, encourage them to become fellows. Uh, we um, also had, of course, the help of the Institute for Policy Studies, which is where we work. Um, they provide us with the space that we work at, uh, as well as um, you know the the meeting spaces, as well as the event spaces. Um, we also had, um, I think, I think those were a ma the major assets that we began with. After that, we've got some help from um, additional members, fellows. Now we have some partnerships with a university called UMass Boston. Uh, they are uh, trying to help our fellowship as well by providing potential candidates, in particular candidates of color that live in Jamaica Plain. Um, and uh, in the future, we expect to have additional uh, help from other organizations, uh, like the Main Streets organizations and the business organizations. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And again, um, Carlos, we're, we don't have any other hands up, but I did have a, a question uh, sure. for you. If you could give us a story or an example of um, you know, some project or person that comes to mind, um, you know, one of the fellows or one of their projects. Oh, of course, of course. Um, um, yes, so not all, not all of our fellows continue for the entire cycle. Uh, some fellows come um, because they would like to get a job right away. They feel the pressure of paying bills. And one example is um, a fellow called Molly Wexler, Molly Wexler Romick. She's an extraordinary woman who came um, the first thing she told me was, you know, I like the fellowship, I want to do this, but I need a job. Um, how do I do that, right? So uh, we, you know, we went through a couple of months coaching her. I coached her uh, on uh, what kind of jobs she could get, but also to step back and understand what kind of life she wants to lead. 
She works on a project called the Time Exchange, which is one of the most challenge, challenging projects that we have because it's not necessarily based on money. It's based on exchanging time. Um, and it's a very difficult concept sometimes to uh, provide to folks. So through about two months, she constantly challenged me. You know, she would say, yes, this is great. What skills am I learning? Uh, uh, you know, how can I apply these skills to get a full-time job? Uh, could you please, you know, connect me with the right folks? So she really challenged me to look at what does it mean to give benefits to an individual who needs, you know, this kind of benefit now and cannot wait uh, uh, for the future uh, for, for too much time. Uh, she eventually found a job uh, uh, working in Cambridge. Uh, it's another city close to Boston. Uh, she found a job. Uh, and she was uh, very grateful uh, for what did, we did with her. Of course, you know, we, we uh, lost her capacity, but we gained a great alumni. Uh, she, uh, I interviewed her. I did an exit interview with her. And in that exit, exit interview, I asked her, uh, what did she learn? What is the thing that she's going to take away? And she said to me, I remember this very clearly, uh, she said to me, I understand what does it mean to be in very uh, tough need. Uh, I also understand that I'm not, even though I am in need, there are those who I work with that, I am in, that are in greater need. And so my takeaway is that when I go out there into the, into the full-time work, uh, re-engage into the market, uh, I will have a deeper understanding of what of, of knowing where people come from and what their necessities are, and that will make me a better manager, you know, understanding how people uh, come into the work, you know, not seeing everybody, uh, not being colorblind or class blind, but really understanding, um, you know, that some may need uh, further help, uh, that not everybody comes on the same boat. Uh, so that, I was very proud of that. You know, she left after two months, but I was very proud that she was able to gain that deeper understanding. Uh, she now has uh, resigned that initial job that she has, and she's working now full time for a solar panel company uh, because she really wanted to have this energy efficiency mission-based life that she's always wanted to um, aspire to. Uh, so that's a great inspirational story that I, I love uh, to tell. I have any other stories, but I'll stop there if you know if you want me to keep going, let me know. Yeah, thank you for that. That gives it a, a real personal flavor. And we've got, um, Ken, you've got your hand up, so we'll take that question. Then, Carlos, I'll ask you for closing comments, and we'll adjourn for today. Okay, thank you. So over to yeah. you, Ken. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks again, Carlos. And uh, I, um, I appreciate the opportunity to ask another question. Um, what sort of context do you offer the fellows in terms of uh, the transition perspective on uh, where we're headed in terms of the economy and environment and energy, and also the new economy perspective in terms of uh, you know what, how the new economy will look and what sort of uh, uh, methods of exchange we'll have, how things will be structured, um, you know localization, all of that. Uh, what what kind of perspective are you able to offer to folks, and, and how do they respond to that? Fantastic question. Um, at the orientation session, we prepare a um, couple of exercises to help them um, understand what we mean by the new economy. Uh, we provide them slightly some systemic uh, vision, such as um, uh, uh, imagine that that you know the ga the price of gasoline is uh, four or five times uh, what it is now. How would you transport yourself? How would you go to work? How would you um, perform the things that um, are dependent on that? Or imagine that uh, the change of weather patterns, such as this uh, snow we're having in Boston, is not something that is just uh, once every hundred years, but it's actually every year. How would you develop resilience? How would you get to know your neighbors? So we provide this kind of vision uh, during the orientation session. In addition to that, they challenge us, right? They say to us, okay, well, that's great, but um, 
you know, I may not see these changes for some time, and I need a job now. I need to be able to engage in the current economy. So uh, we wrestle with that. We don't have um, a very specific, rigid answer to them about how to engage um, with the current economy. But what we say is that um, we are open, uh, you know, for them to uh, provide those challenges when we do our work because those challenges usually bring the ingredient of race and class with them. Um, some folks may have, um, uh, you know, they start uh, uh, surfacing that some folks may have more time to think about longer term changes while other folks need something now. Uh, so to summarize my answer, we provide uh, systemic um, um, uh, information through data and through visioning process, but we also engage them in how they react to what, they're, to what we're providing. Uh, we use the data as something, as scientific data that, uh, you know, we believe it's right, uh, but we also want to be uh, very cognizant of their own individual and current needs. Uh, and how they get to engage the new economy is something that we always guide them to. How, the, how Molly Wexler finds you know, selling solar panels as a way to make money now as well as, um, you know, providing energy efficiency is something that she, uh, we guide her to do, but she uh, took the steps to do herself. All right, so um, that's what I would say. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. For, for uh, responding, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, Carlos, thank you so much. Just wanted to give you a chance for some closing comments. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, again, I just want to close by saying that uh, ultimately this fellowship is based on the belief that everybody contributes. Everybody has value to contribute to envisioning something that we're trying to do together. Um, and for us, it's a matter of understanding how we can develop a platform that enables that, that channels that value, um, and how we can address those tough questions and those tough divides across race, class, gender, and age. Our work in the fellowship is something that we are trying to nurture for a long time. Um, for us, it's important to concentrate on the hearts and minds of the individual, uh, and of course, uh, one of the things that I also wanted to say um, finally is that their voice and the voice of every one of us is needed. So the more we can include those voices, um, the more we can provide opportunities for folks to voice their concerns, for voice how they're going to engage in the economy, I think the better and more successful will be to develop sustainable leadership. I'll end with that. Carlos, I want to thank you. Thank you for uh, creating such a wonderful model that we can really learn from and for sharing that with us today. And I wanted Great. to thank the participants, too, for joining us today. And please join us again. So on behalf of us here at Transition US, and big thanks to Carlos. Thank you all for joining us. And have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.